<laughs> okay. All right. We we uh, we're talking about properties, and uh, if you remember, those are characteristics of the system or parts of the system that we can measure at any time. Obvious things, uh, especially obvious things in a, in a class like this would be temperature and pressure. We're going to deal with temperature and pressure uh, quite possibly more than almost any other property there is. But there's some others that are going to come into it. Uh, you might expect density would be pretty important, especially when we're working with fluids, especially when we're working with gaseous fluids because uh, the density of those fluids changes markedly and, and uh, uh, quickly and oftenly. Um, however, we won't deal with density as important as it is. We'll deal with something, though, very, very similar to it, but it's just something that's more useful to us. I'll be to that, that very, very shortly. Um, but then there's also some, some very new ones that are going to come in because one of the things we're going to need to look at is the energy content in the uh, system or in the, the, the working fluid of the system at any time. And there's going to be a couple ways we need to look at that. So those will be new system properties that are going to come in to us. Uh, one thing we'll do a lot with this is uh, look at processes. That's really the dynamics part of this. Dynamics, if you remember, is uh, a change in a system. So uh, we're going to have to look at a lot of processes. This is, in simplest terms, a change in the system. Any time one of the properties changes, we consider that a process. And so we'll be looking at lots of particular processes. However, uh, they're, they're a little bit different in the way that we see them because if you remember, we had two types of systems we're going to be looking at. What were they? Open and closed. So in a closed system, uh, one of our simplest type of closed systems we're going to deal with is a very simple idea of a cylinder with a... Uh, non-leaking but non-binding piston. Did no friction in it, so it slides. It responds to the volume of the system very, very quickly and, and has no effect on it uh, because there's no friction there. But it also, since it's a closed system, none of the mass leaks out. Well, you know, you know where I buy these. Right? I get them from Earl at Ace, yeah. He gives me these perfect pistons and cylinders. So we can, we can do all kinds of things with the whatever fluid is in the system, and there's a picture of it right now. Um, we'll, we'll heat it, and we'll, we'll push on the piston, and we'll pull on the piston, and we'll do all kinds of things and see, to see what that thermodynamic system does. But <laughs> it will start at one state, and then we'll do something to it, pour in some energy, take out some energy, uh, lift or press on the piston or some whatever it is we need to do, and that will take it to another state, and that's a process. Simply going from one state to another by some means of us uh, uh, twiddling with that system by whatever we do. We might. Oh, to, to, to make the, all the chemical students in, in here, we might put a little Bunsen burner underneath it with, with red flame. Realistic is that? See, it even looks more like a picture now, a photograph. It's actually blue. <laughs> <laughs> Since when is flame blue? The, the flame I have <laughs> this is my Bunsen burner. Thank you very much. Some flames are red. The flames that come out of my my car well, when I accelerate. Really I don't want to argue. <laughs> okay. So so whatever it is we do to it whether it's heated or cold or any of those kinds, it'll go from one 
state, which is a set of properties that define that system, that fluid at that time, and it could be, uh, it's at this temperature, this pressure, uh, but there's other things we'll look at as well that we need. And then it goes to some other pressure, some other temperature. Whatever. That'll be a process. And very often, we'll actually graph it uh, some kind. We, we might actually look at temperature versus pressure or any of the other variables we're going to be looking at. And we know that we'll start at one place, and by whatever means, we'll get to some other place, and that will be our process. Very easy uh, idea, I think, for a closed system. For an open system, it's a little different than that. Remember, an open system is where the, uh, the volume we're looking at stays the same, and we let mass flow through it. Whereas in here, we're letting the mass stay the same, and we let whatever happens to it happen. That was a control mass system. An open system is a control volume system. So, for example, we'll look at turbines, which in sort of a cartoony picture kind of look like that from the outside. Uh, and then down the middle of the turbine runs a shaft, and then on that shaft are veins. So, there's my little cartoon picture of a turbine, and what we do with the turbine is we squirt in high, very high energy fluid. Uh, usually that high energy includes high kinetic energy. Usually it's very, very fast. In fact, concerns in, in turbine design is to make thing, sure things don't go supersonic uh, at times. And that's all a matter of the properties of the fluid, including its velocity. So very high energy fluid comes in the small end of the turbine, starts hitting those blades, makes them spin, and as it moves through the turbine, it goes to successive blades uh, and imparts its energy, the energy from the fluid into the energy of the blades, and then causes, of course, this uh, shaft to turn. Then we connect that to a generator or uh, a grinding wheel to do, grind our flour for the season, or whatever it is we need to do to that. The reason it gets bigger and bigger and bigger is because the fluid's losing lots of energy and starts to expand. So the fluid itself is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Its volume, is, its density is going down. And so we need to make the turbine bigger to have room for it. And then out here, squirts uh, fluid that may be quite spent. Maybe uh, you even just take it and dump it. Uh, or maybe you take it and run it back through the system, reheat it, re-energize it, repressurize it, whatever it is we do. But we'll talk about all that stuff and then run it through the system again. Uh, we won't use that for the drawing. Typically, when we get to turbines, we'll just draw that to make it simple. Uh, a compressor is essentially a turbine run backwards. We put a motor on the shaft, run it like that, pull in low energy fluid, pressurize it, energize it, and out comes compressed fluid then. Uh, that's basically what a what a, a simple compressor, a type of compressor. But anyway, uh, as an open system, and the process that we'll look at for that is we'll know something about the fluid that comes in, and the process that fluid undergoes is this whole business such that it comes out at some other state. And that will be the process we look at for the turbine. We'll have things to study that happen to this, the fluid as it goes from state one to state two. For example, a lot of the energy comes out, in fact, that'll be in, in the form of work 
out of the turbine because that's what that's why we run turbines. So they'll do work for us. That work generally being running a generator. But uh, turbines can be very hot, so there might be heat loss as well, uh, or they might be insulated. Those are all the kind of things we're going to have to look at because those are all things that affect what happens uh, affects the size of that W, you know, but for, for the cost it takes to get the fluid to point one, which is highly energized, often it's very, very hot, and moving very, very fast, that costs money to get there. If you want this turbine to produce work, you want it to produce as much work as possible. So you want the greatest difference between these, so you get more work out. You also want fewer losses anywhere else. You want to reduce the friction losses. There's a huge engineering effort that goes into designing turbine blades. Absolutely. Uh, GE spends billions of dollars in their turbine business designing and manufacturing those turbine blades. It's, it, incredibly important simply to get more work out of the system from what's available going in. So that'll be the type of process we look at in an open system, just the difference between the inlets and the outlets in terms of what the, the state of the fluid is. All right, to, to help you a little bit with one of the homework problems coming up, let's look at, at one of the properties, uh, that of pressure. Uh, it's not done so much this way anymore, but it, it still is, and that's the, the pressurization and the pressure measurement of a fluid, maybe in a tank of some kind, by the use of what's called a manometer. And that's just simply a tube attached to the tank. So if we have a, a tank here that maybe uh, contains some kind of gas that we want to uh, possibly want to pressurize, but maybe we want to just store it. We don't want to lose it. And we want to know what that pressure is because if you don't know what that pressure is, you can't make sure that you have a tank that can take that pressure. For those of you taking strength of materials with me, uh, we'll be looking at designing pressure vessels in a couple weeks. How do we make sure a tank is strong enough to hold whatever pressure is in it? But we also, of course, need to keep that fluid from leaking out. So we'll put some other fluid in the tube. with which the, two, the fluid in the tank is immiscible. Does that excite you chemistry students, that word? Does everybody else know what that means? Yeah. Huh? I was going to ask if everyone else knew that. Yeah, I guess they don't. Let's just laugh at them. What's immiscible mean? Yeah, they don't mix. So. Uh, uh, it's very typical for oil to be used in the manometer tube because oil doesn't mix with too many things. If we're storing, if we have water in there, uh, oil mixes, uh, oil is great in the tube because oil and water don't mix. Everybody, your grandmother knows that. Uh, not as common anymore. It used to be very common to use mercury, but mercury is a toxic substance, so they're using other fluids. But we look at the height of the interfaces of this fluid in the tube and use that to tell us what the pressure is in the tank. And we have a, a homework problem that does just this. Uh, it just happens to use two fluids through the tube, but the ideas are very, very similar. So that we can figure out what the pressure is here in the tank based on nothing more than the difference in height, well, based on a little bit more, but basically uh, just the difference in heights, which of course makes this very easy to, to set up as a, as a meter. In fact, these are called manometers. I 
because I guess from the Spanish they're made by hand. Who, who speaks Spanish? You speak Spanish? No, you don't. You speak German. No, you don't speak anything. <laughs> who speaks you know German? No, that's somebody that's studying real. German today. Yeah. What? I know I'm not Spanish. No, that's not real. <laughs> mono. Mono means hand. And meter means as made by. I don't think so. H-O-A, <laughs> mono, means made by hand. Yes. Yeah. And I and, and I think... Uh, huh? Yeah, that's a hand meter. Anyway, uh, the, the, the deal is, depending on just what the specific gravity of this fluid is, and we use the symbol SG to designate specific gravity. Depending on what the specific gravity of that fluid is, depends on how high, actually, the, the difference between these two interfaces will go. Uh, the specific gravity is basically how heavy the fluid is. So if it's a very heavy fluid, the pressure in the tank won't be able to push that column up as high. Um, but you just adjust the meter for that because it does depend on the specific gravity. Specific gravity defined as, very simply, the density of whatever that fluid is. And we'll say for this example that it's oil. In the homework problem, you've got oil in part of it and mercury in part of it. But uh, you just use the specific gravity of each of those as we get to them over that of water. So if we know the specific gravity of a fluid, we can take the known specific uh, density of uh, water and figure out the density of the fluid. And then we can use that in figuring out what the, what the deal is with the manometer. What we're most interested in is the difference in height between the two interfaces of the fluid in the tube. And we'll use that to figure out what the what the pressure is. Most of you have taken physics too, right? Or are oh we're not running into this term, are we? Uh, but most of you have taken it. We have a couple who haven't, but but this part of it, actually what I found is usually the students who have took physics too don't remember this part anyway, so it doesn't matter. Right. Well, what we do is uh, notice that the, this end of the tube is open to the atmosphere, so we know that the pressure right there is atmospheric pressure. Is the pressure whatever the atmosphere is. So this reading is going to change on different days as the atmospheric pressure changes. Uh, however, uh, it's it's it's. This is part of the equation, so it's, it's just something you, you input. Um, that comes in a couple, couple different flavors. We saw on Wednesday that a typical atmospheric pressure is about 101 kilopascals, a little bit less, give or take, 101.3, I think it's taken as the standard. Uh, this can also be called one atmosphere. So we take the atmospheric pressure itself and make it into a unit. Uh, other values that you've heard is uh, maybe, uh, I think in Europe they use bars as the pressure unit. Um, inches of mercury is pretty common. That's still what the standard on weather, weather shows. Inches of mercury. <laughs> inches of mercury is just simple. It's, it's not this kind of setup, but it's how much, how high the pressure of the atmosphere can push a column of mercury, and you just simply measure that. Uh, it's a different setup than this, but that's the basic idea. The greater the pressure, the more it'll push on one end and push the other end up against gravity, and so they just measure the height of the mercury column, and that's uh, inches of mercury that that my best friend ever, Paul Cayano, uh, tells us about every every morning when you're having your Cheerios. Count chocolate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. Right there. If Alan doesn't have Captain Crunch every morning, the, there's nothing right with the world, I can tell. 
They made Genius. some no, stale beer. <laughs> stale <laughs> beer. <laughs> 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 All right, so there's, there's lots of different ways uh, for us to measure uh, pressure, whether it's atmospheric pressure or not. There's lots of different units for pressure. Some of them, as you can imagine, are, are, are kind of colorful in, in their origin. Uh, in the back of the book uh, is a, con a table of conversions. It's not a real long table, but it's got everything in there we need, and there's about 12 different ones for pressure in there. So the idea we do with this is we start with a known pressure and work back through the system to the pressure we're looking for based upon what we're seeing as we go. So we start with the atmospheric pressure and then we go down in a column of fluid. And for those of you that took physics 2 and actually paid any attention, you know that the pressure increases linearly as you go through a, a liquid uh, uh, a liquid height. How does the, the pressure change linearly? It's rho, rho g. So it's increasing, so we'll add this to the atmospheric pressure. So it's rho, uh, the density of the fluid we're going through. In this case, it's the oil. But we can get that from the specific gravity of the oil that was, oh, well, I'll give you that value. Let's say it's 1.6. Rho, G. And then the height of the column, or uh, generally we look at it as, as depth. If any of you scuba dive, you know you're, you're intimate with this, that as you go down, uh, deeper, get the pressure goes up and up and up, and it goes linearly um, by the depth you're going. So uh, we go all the way down to here, and then come back up to here. But what we lose, or what pressure we gain going down to here, we lose going back up to there by the same amount. So. We don't care really about this lower part of the tube. We only need to go to right here because these two parts subtract each other. They cancel. So we only need then rho g h, whatever this difference is in height of the two interfaces. That's how much the pressure has increased from atmospheric down to this point. But that's the pressure of the tank that we're looking for. And so it's as straightforward as that. We assume, and it's not a bad assumption, that the pressure everywhere in a gas tank is the same because the density is so low that the pressure doesn't change very much with height in a, a tank of gas. This was liquid, but this is some kind of gas in the storage tank that we're measuring the pressure of that that we're trying to find. And so we can find then the pressure from that. Uh, good values to use for the density of uh, water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. That's not a coincidence uh, necessarily because uh, Remember, all those uh, metric units are, are intertwined with each other in some, some regard. With the homework problem, you have two fluids. You have an oil and a mercury. And so you just have to add on uh, another term here as you, oh, actually, I think, I think the tank is, has water in it with uh, some air up above it. So you'll have to go through the water column, then through the oil column, then through the mercury column, and uh, you just add other terms of these rho GH terms as you go through a different height of liquid in the, in the system. Um, what The only thing you have to worry about is if you go down 
to deeper, you're increasing the pressure. If you're going up in the columns uh, uh, in the system some way, you're going to lower pressure, so you would subtract off that term as the pressure decreases with increase in height, increases with increase in depth. Um, if you remember, I spoke to you about a term we call gauge pressure. Now, this is one of the oddest things, and I, I have no idea what the deal here is. We spell it without a U, even though the word gauge typically has a U in it. So I don't know where that U is. Somebody's got it. What? <laughs> what? I don't care what he said. Never mind. Just as long as he's not doing that stupid Jerry Springer thing. <laughs> This is the pressure now in the tank. Is that gauge pressure or absolute pressure? If you remember, we have some level of zero pressure and then Somewhere above that, in fact, at 101 kilopascals for one atmosphere, or I think it's 760 millimeters of mercury, we have our atmospheric pressure. Uh, we in our class will tend to treat that pretty much as a constant, kind of like we do with G in physics, uh, but it does vary. And then gauge pressure, if you remember, is whatever pressure our system reads above atmospheric. So when you put a pressure gauge on your car tires, it's comparing atmospheric pressure to the pressure in the car tires, and it'll say something like 30 PSI, and we'll ignore the about 15 PSI that the atmosphere itself has over absolute zero. So your gauge only reads this. Is this pressure we calculated here atmospheric or gauge pressure? So this might be the pressure of the system that we're looking for. But is that pressure this gauge pressure or is it the absolute pressure? <clears throat> Here's a clue for you. See if this helps any. Let's take this equation where we found that pressure and rearrange it a little bit. Let's do P, we'll take the P atmosphere over. And so I have that equals, and then it'll be the rho GH left over. Just a little algebra. Now I have P minus P atmosphere. What is P minus P atmosphere on this little chart. That's the gauge pressure. So now I have the gauge pressure. Because remember, it's the difference of the pressure of the system compared to atmospheric. And so that's what we have there. So this is the absolute pressure of the system that we calculate with that, uh, with that manometer. It takes some getting used to. Um, I find just from not having taught this for a couple years, I get rusty with this stuff. Uh, just get less familiar with it when you don't use it for a couple years, and so you haven't used it at all. So you're really rusty. I'm just rusty because I'm old. I heard you nodding again. <laughs> now you're rude. All right. Let's uh, talk about a couple more things, and we'll do a little bit with ease, and then we're done for for a big weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Time to go get some more stale beer. Captain Crunch. Captain Crunch. Gosh, and there's no football games this weekend, is there? No. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
do homework for me. Damn right. All right. So let's uh, let's go back to these properties a little bit. If you're not getting the idea yet, you will soon. They're pretty important for us. We're gonna have to pay a lot of attention to these. Now, uh, in this class, there are two basic types of properties. They they uh, they don't. Uh, they're very closely related to each other, but they don't mix and match. And what I mean is uh, in, in an equation where we have a couple things putting together, like we were adding pressures in that equation we just had, uh, you've got to add the same types of properties to each other. And if you have uh, one property equal to another, they have to be the very same type of property. We really only have two types. They're pretty easy to tell apart, both in concept and in the notation we use. One type of property uh, are properties that are additive. So take a second to take a second to write that down. It's important. It's up there in ink. Right up there in black and white. Is that important? Uh, properties that are additives. For example, volume. If I have uh, uh, one quart of this liquid and one quart of that liquid and I put them together, I've got two quarts. Volume is an additive property. So there's one good example. Uh, Sometimes when we need to, uh, we get a couple V's in here. You're going to have to be very careful with the V's. We got at least three we're going to need through the course. So I typically will try to put a bar to mean volume. Uh, what about mass? Is that an additive property? Yeah, of course. I got a kilogram of this, a kilogram of that, put them together, I got two kilograms. Nothing else happens with it in any way other than that. We can't, we can't make anything up other than that. Um, some properties aren't additive, though. For example, if I have uh, uh, some water at 60 degrees, and some water at 80 degrees and I put them together, I don't get water at 140 degrees. I get water somewhere in between because temperature is not additive. So we got some, of course, that aren't. And that's true no matter what the temperature scale used. You can't add temperatures like that. Uh, what else? Uh, density. Additive or not? No, if I have this density and that density and put them together, I don't get twice the density of the two as added together. So, uh, density most certainly is not. Uh, oddly, I told you we'll hardly work with density and then second time it's appeared today. So, we're almost done with it for the most part. Um, uh, as we get to this point. Uh, there's lots of others we're going to be working with. Um, some of them are fairly obvious. What about pressure? Is pressure additive? If I have a fluid at two pounds per square inch pressure and one at four and I put them together, do I get a fluid at six pounds per square inch? No, pressure is not additive. It is also then uh, uh, a non-additive one. Other obvious ones. Uh, well, some of them, in, in a way, appear uh, in different forms in both. Uh, but I'll get to that in a second. These we call extensive properties. Extensive properties are those properties 
that are additive in nature. Probably the two biggest ones being volume and mass. I don't know. Well, yeah, there's others. There's others. Um, in certain forms. These are called intensive properties. Extensive and intensive. Now, uh, certain other ways that uh, uh, we could see properties in here. For example, um, kinetic energy. If I have uh, something moving with a certain kinetic energy and something else, I don't know how we add them together. Uh, well, if we had, if we had two, two cars, each with their own kinetic energy, and they reach out and hold hands. Now it's one car with people holding hands. Different momentum. Huh? Same momentum. Well, what happens to the kinetic energy? The speed didn't change of that system that was two one cars. Now it's one two car. Did the kinetic energy double? Yeah, it did because the mass doubled. So kinetic energy is an example of of uh, an extensive property. Um, however, if we look at kinetic energy per unit mass, if I've got, if I take those cars, figure out what their kinetic energy is, but then divide by the mass. So instead of one half mv squared, I have one half v squared. Is that additive? Because I take the, the double car system, same velocity, but I divide out the mass, I don't have the same kinetic energy, I don't have double the kinetic energy, I have whatever I had before because I've taken the mass out of it. That is an intensive property and what we tend to do here to help us with this, when we have a, a property that can be in both places, because here it's additive, here, when I divide by the mass, it's not. We go to lowercase to designate that it's an intensive property that can be used in an extensive form if we let the mass be back in, back part of it. So that's caps there and lowercase there. Uh, volume is another one of those. So let's see. Let's uh, let's take volume divided by the mass. So I have some volume of uh, I have some system of a certain volume has a certain mass in it. But I take whatever that mass is and divide that volume by it. Well, by our little system. That would be a little v. So there's how I tend to make my little v's. This will be real important to us, this, this property. Um, but you've kind of seen that property before. Not in exactly that form. Volume divided by mass. You haven't seen that before. How do we calculate density? Mass over volume. So this is the inverse of density. And there's now the, the main reason we'll get rid of density because now it's a per unit mass basis, which is going to be much uh, easier for a lot of the things we need to look at, to do things on a per mass basis. Another thing we tend to do with these properties that can be in both but are in the intensive category down here is we'll use the term specific, which uh, that's, that's the way Balboa named the uh, Pacific Ocean. He woke up in the water one day, you know, he came over the Cascade Mountains, 
they were tired, they made a camp on the beach, but they happened to be low tide, the water came in, they woke up in the morning, the water said, man, I gotta be more specific where I sleep. Mm. Why don't you take notes when I say stuff? <laughs> All right, so, so this will be the specific volume when we refer to it. No other way. If I mean volume, I'll say so. If I mean specific volume, I'll say so. If I'm writing volume, I'll use capital V. If I'm writing specific volume, I'll use lowercase v. And, and uh, very rarely will I screw up on that because it's, it's that important that we, that we keep that straight. And so this is the specific kinetic energy and whatever other uh, uh, properties we could add to that that list either way. So, kilo, remember the units for kinetic energy? The joule. So, kilojoules per kilogram we'll use a lot. And uh, not mass over volume, uh, but volume over mass. So, meters cubed per kilogram we'll use a lot. And so we'll be looking at processes where maybe we're looking at the extensive properties, maybe we're looking at the intensive properties. Uh, it depends on what we want to do with the process, what we want to do with the problem, which we'll use. But we'll be very clear which it is because of this, you can't mix and match these in an equation. Uh, just use one kinetic energy here and a specific energy over there because we can do this too with, with specific uh, potential energy, gravitational potential energy. You know, the units won't work now if we're not careful with those. So we don't mix and match these properties other than by dividing by the mass. Okay, so we've talked about systems at some particular thermodynamic state as defined by the properties. That leads us to what's called the state postulate. Which is very important. Ease will not work for you if you forget the state postulate. So, don't. Might be a good tattoo. The state postulate. Huh? Got your tattoo artist on speed dial? Okay, the state postulate. to uh, determine or specify or fix or whatever word else you might use in there to determine the state of a system. And don't worry. If you don't like the wording, you can change it a little bit before you get your tattoo. But once you've gotten your tattoo, you're not going to want to go changing the wording. So think about this. To determine the state of the system, we need, and by the state of the system, that means we don't know uh, just some, of, we know all of the properties that we could possibly need to know. If I, if I know the state of the system, I'll know its density, I'll know its pressure, I'll know its temperature. It'd be useless to us in this class if we didn't know those things when we're talking about the state of the system. We wouldn't know what the state of the system is if we don't know where it is, what its properties are. We need at least two. That means one won't work, but three will. 
we need at least two intensive properties. Oh, sorry, not, that's just not good enough. Uh, too intensive. See, it's a good thing you didn't run out and get that tattoo. You'd be screwed up. At least two intensive, independent properties. Now you can go get your tattoo. Must be intensive. They must be independent. Uh, that might not be as obvious to you as, uh, as the other word intensive, because uh, there's intensive defined right there. We need to know the properties on a per mass basis if we want to fix the state of the system. By fix it, I mean not, I don't mean we, we, we hold it there, I mean that we know what it is, and then we can find the other properties from it. Uh, by independent, well, if you think back to, I don't know, seventh grade general science and you did the boiling water experiment, you, you heated water up and its temperature rose for a while and then it started to boil, what happened to its temperature? It stayed the same there. Now, the water is undergoing a process there because it's, a lot of it's turning from liquid into gas, but the temperature and the pressure were never changing. When a, when a liquid is boiling, temperature and pressure are not independent. So when a liquid's boiling, we can't use temperature and pressure to specify the state of the system because they're not independent there. The temperature of a boiling substance is determined by the local pressure. Did you find that out when you went to Colorado? Didn't it seem like the coffee was cold? Didn't it? You don't drink coffee? No. Hot Tea? Hot chocolate? Didn't it seem cool, too cool? Cooler? I know when, when I moved from Colorado down to sea level in Oregon, I couldn't, um, the, the t coffee was so hot it was hard to drink because of the greater atmospheric pressure, the boiling temperature went up. Are you implying that you drink your coffee at boiling temperature? <laughs> it's yeah, When it comes out of the, per, the coffee thing, that's, that's, that's how coffee pots work. They boil the water. What is your, how do you make how, your how do you, coffee? I mean, are you actually, how do you? No, but it boils. <laughs> how do you know is what I'm saying. One's colder than the other. They're both too hot to drink. No, but as soon as no, 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 Co coffee at 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 her her Russian prince's condominium in Dale. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's markedly cooler. So it's, it's, it's 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 you know it's 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 easily the difference between having black coffee here and putting in some cold cream. It the temperature drops significantly. Huh? To to boil it, the temperature is much is yeah. lower. If you go to if you go out to the space station, two twenty here. What is it? One eighty there. Uh, two. Well, it's two twelve here. Two twelve. It's 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 like one ninety eight or something there. If I remember, I don't remember exactly because I don't go back there. Because I hate that place. The coffee's cold. Um, uh, if you go to outer space, and, and my, my, uh, my stupid brother-in-law tried to do this, he wanted to do this experiment, so he started to roll down the window on the space station. <laughs> but luckily the commander said, no, I don't think you want to do that. But at zero, at, in outer space, where there is no pressure, the boiling temperature is essentially zero, it just flashes to, to, to gas instantly so when you when when you go through that open window that my brother-in-law opened <laughs> go through it. Uh, you <laughs> essentially boil to death it's not temperature boiling but you're uncomfortable because now all you all your blood turned to uh, blood vapor 
which is lots bigger, so you blow up. It's a, it's a, it's a mess. Now I, now I see who's writing that down as oh good ways to murder people. <laughs> First, buy a space station. <laughs> Second, <laughs> you gave us like a, a little extra sheet or something that talked about that. Cause there was like an astronaut who was. Who did? I think it was you. There was an astronaut who was in training in uh, a zero G, no pressure environment, and he had like a hole in his suit or something. It, it was on Earth, but uh, it was like the article said like the, the last thing that I remember before he passed out was like boiling saliva on his tongue or something like that. Probably bubbling. Or bubbling. It wouldn't be hot, but it would be it vaporizing. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember that. No. Yeah. It sounds too gruesome for something I'd read. Coming from the person who just was talking about blood vapor exploding <laughs> human beings. <laughs> just just throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm out of here. That's why they lock the doors from the outside on the space station. Because otherwise they'd open I go, I'm going for a walk. Because they get pissed off at each other after a while. It's, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm just going to go on a walk until I calm down. <laughs> so that's like telling somebody to want to go to hell. You put you All right. walk. Uh, <laughs> remember this. You're going to need this because we're going to use ease to find all of the system properties that we need in a particular state. And if you don't tell ease what the two intensive independent properties it, you have to find the other properties you need to do the problems, it won't work. Uh, I, you usually just get an, uh, an error message. I think it comes up with the error message, uh, two independent properties needed, you haven't given me that. So pay attention to this uh, once we get into pulling the properties we need out of ease um, before we, uh, when we get there. You're going to need two intensive independent <coughs> properties. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we do a talk about ease a little bit so you can get some weekend work? Is that the whole of the state postulate? That's, That's it? Okay. Yeah. So, That's pretty short tattoo. Yeah, so yeah, you don't need a whole lot of space, so you can put it on your chest or something where it's real small. Yeah. Probably shorten it to 10 cents. You, you, you can get more because you have a big chest. You can get lots, <laughs> lots of tattoos on there. You can get mother. And a, a ship, and, <laughs> may, and then you can do that thing with your stomach, so the ship goes. <laughs> 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 All right. Anything else before we?